In my family, it's always the men that cook more than the women. Grandfather only knew simple foods that his wife taught him. She loved kabocha, and we'd joke about how ofkuru no aji, or the mother's touch, would come out whenever he made kabocha no nizuke, or boiled pumpkin for us. Put the scraps of food you would have to save in the metal pot, then put it on top of the kerosene stove. Feed it water when it starts evaporating. When the water is tan, put some salt and powdered broth to create vegetable stock. I've always tried repl to replicate it, but something about how he measured his ingredients by his hands throws me off. I've given up on replicating the flavors he used to lure into the kabocha. Lately, when I make curry, I roast the kabocha, then use the immersion blender and put the roasted kabocha into the broth and blend until the broth is bright orange. This lends a savory yet sweet component into the final product. I also add dark chocolate and apples. Grandmother's family owns an apple orchard in Fukushima, rather owned. Most of the crop was destroyed with the natural disasters that struck Fukushima. Take the vegetable peel, ve take the vegetable stock you created and set it aside. Peel potatoes, carrots, onions. Create your cat's paw before you use the knife. Chop it into small cubes. Put peels aside in a container and save it for the next time. I fought for my life from the moment I was born. I was in a neonatal intensive care unit after being revived shortly after birth. My first memory is being a little kid and having a blood transfusion to get my iron levels up. My big brother Nico tells me that our aunt, uncle would gamble and earn money to get treatment for me. I ate leafy greens if grandfather prepared it. He made a soup out of spinach and fish broth. If we're lucky, there will be some pork. If not, don't worry, it's still good with just veggies. Put some vegetable oil into the metal pot, get it heated up. Put the vegetables in and let it cook until onions are translucent. Make sure you give a hearty sprinkle of sea salt. After grandfather had a heart attack, he came to live with us on base in Japan. I was in and out of the hospital with health issues, and he was the only one who was able to stay with me as we both recovered. We'd decorate my room with glow-in-the-dark paint and draw stars, constellations, galaxies. He made a lantern with cotton on the outside, so it looked like a cloud. I was unable to go outside to stargaze, so he brought the universe to me. Look for the tomorrows, he'd say. Eventually, this shall pass. Pour the vegetable stock into the veggies. Peel the apple and pear, grate it. Watch your fingers. Pour the grated apple and pear into the mixture. Dice a knob of ginger and garlic. Put that in as well. Death, it's a mysterious thing. I've experienced it and came back. There's nothingness for you, and there's sorrow for those who live without you. At the final moment, you either succumb to the tiredness, or you fight. Continue to fight despite everything. Death is a mysterious thing. Grief grants you a brief respite from the world where you're allowed to withdraw with your kin. But what they don't tell you is that the world continues on without you. You're left behind, but hey, your family on the inside is there and your family on the outside waits for you to be better. Death is a mysterious thing. The body that remains is them, but not really them. Where does the heart go? Where does the, where does the soul go? I like to think that there's something beyond the world, but I'm uncertain if there's such a, a thing like a storybook ending. Get the curry roux ready. Dice it up so it melts down evenly. Get a few squares of semi-sweet chocolate. This is your secret ingredient in making the spices of curry tamer. Mix it, then let it sit on the lowest heat. New Year's Eve, 2015. The American side doesn't understand Nico and I hiding in the kitchen to eat the food we brought up from San Diego to our grandmother's house in San Jose. Japanese rituals that predate the American side by far. I prepare mochi, then the younger kids barge in. 
The moment of solitude in acknowledging the Japanese in us is over. I savor the mochi that we brought up, savory rice cakes that are crispy on the outside and mellow on the inside. Our uncle would always bring home mochi that he'd make at work when we lived with our grandfather as kids. I dip into the soy sauce and weep inside at how homesick I am for Japan. One last thing before serving. Put a hint of soy sauce. Let it sit just for a little bit. 2013, I'm in Japan for a business trip. I catch a train from Tokyo to the countryside where my heart calls home. Mom sends me a sobering message. Treat this visit as your last with your grandfather. You know he's going downhill. I respond, okay, mom. My heart breaks because he's trying his hardest to make sure I'm well fed. He makes stewed kabocha, pickled na napa cabbage, and has a bowl of curry udon from a local family joint. All the foods from my childhood. I weep from nostalgia, and I'm honored that he remain remembers, despite the dementia. He tucks my long red hair into my shirt so it doesn't get into the food. Then he chuckles at how heartily I'm eating, poking my side and quietly going, boyoyong, boyoyong. <laughs> it's a Japanese onomatopoeia for bouncy. <laughs> I gained 10 pounds when I was there. <laughs> my pants are tight so he offers one of his pajama bottoms to wear around the house. I get changed in the back room and I head onto the balcony. The stars shine like they did in my childhood. In a moment of lucidity, he tells me again about Buddhist stories of the heavens and the stars, about Orihime and Hikoboshi, or in English, Vega and Altair, star-crossed lovers separated by the Milky Way. Prepare the vessel for said curry. If there's rice, it's a good day. If not, you and grandpa can make noodles from flour and mineral water. Help knead it until it's a dough. Set it aside. 1994, the one year when I go to Japanese kindergarten. It's dinner time and I'm unable to carry everything, so I stab the chopsticks into the rice. My grandfather scolds me and tells me to put it up on the Buddhist family altar and tells me to go to bed. Father, she, she's only five. She d d doesn't under... No, Akemi. She's old enough to understand that this is forbidden. Tears stream down my face in hunger, and Mama takes my hand, and we go to the back room. She sighs, holding me on her lap as I whimper. Ali, don't do that. It's how you offer food to the dead. That's why you had to give it up. I'm sorry I didn't tell you before. She kisses my head and whispers, wait until he goes to sleep and I'll bring you some food. She returns to a child with a tear-stained face, deep asleep. Help grandpa roll it out. Marvel with how swiftly he makes the dough into flat pancakes. Then watch him cut it up into thin strands. Hold in your breath as he boils the noodles, batch by batch. See how swift he is? This past summer, after I tried to kill myself, I went back to mom to remember where my roots lie, roots lie and, I, and to remember where I come from. His name was Shigeru. My uncle was Shigekatsu. I traced the small markers that were engraved in their honor that are on the makeshift family altar, and I prayed once more recalling the teachings in Buddhism that our grandfather imparted onto us. I prayed for my soul to heal. His picture, the one I held during the funeral, is next to his wife and son. Mom's alone without my brother and I, but we're reunited in spirit. A cousin said that the picture was taken at her father's funeral. She cautioned him that it's more than likely going to be used at his funeral. Our cousin said that with his last words, he hoped that there's a heaven somewhere and that he would be among the stars. I wipe my tears and offer yesterday's dinner of curry, top six straight up to my family. Mama prepares the special plates, 
the ones with the bamboo mats on the bottom so the water drains out easier. She divides the noodles so it's fair, although as an adult, you realize that you always had enough and she ate your remaining meals more often than not. And you eat until your tummy's full. On the last day we were in my hometown for grandfather's funeral, we stopped by the bakery. I buy a Koska curry bread. My brother got a chocolate loaf and mom doesn't get anything. We settle onto the train with our luggage and it sets in that this is the last time we're here for our family. Memories flood me, remembering how as a child, I would commute to the hospital with my grandfather and we'd go to the same bakery and I'd get the curry bread. He explained the significance and I never forgot it. In Yokosuka, well, there's a big na American naval base, there's also a Japanese naval base and for those getting deployed, Friday's meals were curry. It's done that way so that the sailors can keep track of the week. In Yokosuka, each household has a different way of creating their curry. Our family tends to make it sweeter with apples and pears that are grated. I look back at mom. She looks at my bread and I know she's remembering the same thing. I break up ha half and we both munch on the delicious crispy curry bread as tears stream down our face in remembrance. In the end, we are all made of stars, infinite possibilities, and new tomorrows. That is the final lesson he taught me. Poor man's food is easy to stretch out. Our hometown's famous for stews that are technically months old, but due to, re due to replenishing it with new ingredients, it still seems fresh. This is how our curry goes. That was Alex Sharp.